Well, thank you all for coming this morning and just keep on coming in here. There's plenty of room for everybody. Uh, you know, I decided that I wanted to do these little, I want to call them bonbon dharma talks about the seven factors of enlightenment because I think people are having a rough go right now with their lives. And if there's any way that I can be helpful, then I want to be helpful. And one of those ways uh, is to do these little talks about these seven factors. I mean, the other thing I could be doing is, would be picking up garbage <laughs> in the park around the corner. But now that I've discovered that all the homeless men who live there are doing it, um, I'm feeling like I can do more Dharma talks and less of the garbage collection. We'll see how that plays out. <laughs> so life is tough. I mean, life is really, really hard. And it's hard for everybody. You know, at best, we only have to deal with sickness and death. And that's kind of a difficult starting point for all of us. But when we really look at our lives, what we have to deal with everyone, every one of us throughout our lives is great loss as well. And it's hard to remember how to be happy when we're dealing with these kinds of things. And as I thought about this morning, I realized that most of the people who were alive or have been who were alive when the millennium shifted, starting with 2001, we've basically faced now almost 14 years of loss. You know, maybe that's just the 99% of us, but that's most of us. And it's been a shock, I think, for a lot of us in Western society, especially in the United States. Because if you grew up, when I grew up, you grew up with an expectation that hard work brought benefits and happiness and all those kinds of things. And one of the truths of this past 14 years or so is that you can work as hard as you can and give everything you've got and still face great loss. Especially for those of you who came of age in this last great recession. You know, I remember the day when, I actually remember a day in 2008 where I walked out onto the driveway of the Hermitage and I realized that in the course of that morning I had lost 10 years of savings that I had put, put aside for my old age and was down to where I had just about enough to pay off my car. And it was such a shock to my system that I, it was almost like having something pulled out from under me. But what was interesting about that to me was that I realized that in that moment that I had been so lucky to experience a life where I didn't have that kind of pulling out of the rug from under me. And so many of you haven't had that experience. All you've had is this pulling out from rugs, this rug of employment that you count on, this rug of income you can't count on, you know, this rug of a house that you thought you had a mortgage on. And while it's true, we're starting to come back into a place where there are more jobs, thank goodness, for people. And we are starting to figure out how to be in this place and time. The losses don't go away. And we want to run away from that. It's hard. It hurts. It's heartbreak. Um, we get sick from these kinds of things. And what we tend to do, maybe it's just me, but I think I'm not alone here, is we tend to turn to pleasure to run away from these things. And there isn't anything inherently wrong with pleasure. I mean, I'm, I just discovered HBO, <laughs> you know, where has it been all my life? But what we've done is we've turned pleasure into addictions. And that breaks my heart. And the reason why it breaks my heart is because I've been at this particular path, the Zen Buddhist path, for long, long enough to know that it's possible, it's literally possible to live with these losses, if you will, and be happy at the same time. And one of the things about pleasure whether it's, you know, drowning ourselves in television, which is what I could identify with, I'm sure, if I let myself, or drinking or, you know, sex or whatever it is, the trouble with that, writ large, is that it's a running away. And so we're suddenly not only not available to ourselves and our own spiritual growth, but more importantly to me, we're not available to the rest of the world, to be helpful to the rest of the world. So pleasure, wonderful, but not when it becomes an addiction. And 
I'm sure there are lots of scientific ways to know when we're addicted to pleasures, but I have to say from my own experience, especially from my own experience as a Dharma teacher, is that people know when they're addicted to pleasure. We know. And so really what I want to do with these talks is to suggest an alternative. And this alternative comes in the framework of what Buddhists call the seven factors of enlightenment. And in a way, I wish it wasn't, the word enlightenment wasn't used. I wish it was just seven ways to be with the world the way it is and to still manage to be happy and to be of service to other people. The seven factors actually grew out of the Pali Canon, which is the earliest canon of teachings related to Buddha's life. And I always forget one of them, so I brought a cheat sheet so I could read them to you. The first one is mindfulness, and that's what I'll talk about this morning. The second one is investigation of phenomena. Three is energetic effort. Four is ease, ease, which is defined in the Pali Canon, at least, as freedom from pain, trouble, and mostly, and pertinent to this time and place, anxiety. Joy, and joy I define, or I'll define this morning anyway, as that sweet feeling that everything is okay. So when I talk about joy, and especially when I do the longer talk about joy, I'm not talking about bliss. Bliss is wonderful. But again, bliss comes and goes. And joy is something that can be kind of an undercurrent sound in your life. Once we learn how to kind of to let it in, to tell you the truth, that's really what it takes. Concentration. Concentration, I always like to think of as mindfulness that's really aimed at a specific task. That might be one way to think about it. And then the final factor is equanimity. And equanimity is something that I think to my last breath, I'll always wrestle with. It'll be the dragon I wrestle with to my last breath because it really is all about being calm no matter what's coming at us. And that takes a great warrior effort. All right, so back to mindfulness and what mindfulness is. One of the wonderful things that's happened over the course of the last 10 years or so is that mindfulness has become part of the vernacular. And I feel very lucky that that's true. I want to thank people who have been yoga teachers mostly for that. I think that's really where it's expanded into the culture, into all of our culture. But I hear business people talking about mindfulness. They might quite use not use that word and leadership retreats where mindfulness is a component of leadership retreats. And in schools now, uh, I hear more and more about how the kids are asked to be silent at the beginning of a class. Or one friend of mine who's a teacher talks about how when the kids get a little bit too caught up, I don't know if they're still eating as much sugar as I do when I was in school, but when they're just a little bit too frazzled, how she'll have these moments where they get to count to five slowly together. And then she talks about how it changes the whole feeling in the class, just those five minutes of quiet. And those are about learning how to follow your breath. And any of us who have grown up in the Zen tradition have been taught about how mindfulness is really about paying attention. You know, honestly, I swear I've heard 40 different iterations of the teaching about how, you know, the young student climbs the cliff to ask her teacher what she needs to know or what she needs to do to be enlightened. And he says, pay attention. And so she climbs back down and works hard on paying attention and goes, climbs the cliff again. What do I need to do now? Pay attention. And then she goes back down into her life and comes back again and says, what do I need to do now? He says, pay attention. She's like, what? Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. He's like, Ah, you got, that's right. Pay attention. It seems like it's so easy and yet, and yet. But it's a huge antidote and it's a huge antidote to the anxiety you and I are all experiencing. It's a huge antidote to dealing with losses when they come at us kind of full force, to dealing with sickness. It's just this wonderful, wonderful gift that has come out of these teachings that you and I can use but I think it's good every once in a while, and this is one of those moments, to really look a slightly more closely at what mindfulness really, really means. Because it's actually not just paying attention. It's more than that. And I thought maybe I'd just give you a little quick example, or a taste, if you will, of what it feels like when you're really paying attention. And this comes from the book Close to the Ground. I, 
I actually wrote this book in response to the recession. Isn't that interesting? And it was the only way I could think of to be helpful to people. And ironically, I had decided years ago to stop writing books and I told, announced it to anybody who would listen to me. But I have a friend, Kasapa, who kept saying, you got to write, you got to write. And 2008 and 2009 swept me off my own feet so much that I thought, oh, there must be something we can all use that will help us get through this um, huge change that's happening in in the, on the world in the world right now and that's what the book is all about lots and lots of Dharma talks on these factors all right so here's something about mindfulness Bo explores a ladybug my grandson Bo shows up at the door pouting his nap was cut short and he has no interest in peeing like a big boy before we head for the park he's dressed in not one but three superhero accessories a Superman cape a Spider-Man suit, and a Darth Vader helmet. They aren't protecting him from his mood. When we get to the park 10 minutes later, he walks slowly, head down. I give him room to wrestle with his almost three-year-old thoughts. Suddenly he shouts, look, a ladybug has landed on his hand. He can't believe it. It turns out I know quite a bit about ladybugs. I know they love to eat aphids, the mean girls of all things gardening. I know they're really beetles, and they smell through their feet and chew side to side. They touch, smell, and taste through their antenna, and can play dead if they think you're a predator. The bug on Bo's hand is playing dead. As I spout off all my Instafacts, Bo ignores me completely. Instead, he just stares at the ladybug, silenced, so I stare with him. We quietly notice her big black spots and her bright red wing covers and teeny little see-through wings peeking out just under the covers. We see her scary pincher mouth and her tiny little legs that look like they've been whittled out of micro matchsticks. After a while, maybe five minutes, she decides that the two gods staring down, staring her down are probably safe and flies off. Watching her, we look up just in time to see a leaf fall from the tree over our heads. It is Tinkerbell dancing catching the light sometimes and looking like it's ready to do a flip just before it actually does. We're enchanted. As I stare, I think about how every Dharma teacher I've ever known has emphasized mindfulness over just about anything else. Pay attention to your breath. Pay attention to your mantra. Pay attention to your koan. Keep going back to it over and over and over. Don't stray. The Buddha was first in line with this admonition. In the Samyutta Nikaya, he instructs, and what monks is right mindfulness? Here, monks, a monk dwells contemplating the body in the body, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed longing and dejection in regard to the world. He dwells contemplating feelings in feelings, mind in mind, phenomena in phenomena, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed longing and dejection in regard to the world. This is called right mindfulness. That I got lost in paying attention to the ladybug in the leaf is probably the result of 25 years of determined spiritual practice. That Bo was just as lost comes from the purity of his life experience so far. He doesn't know how not to pay attention. It's hard not to be jealous. So there you can get a feel for what mindfulness actually feels like, genuine mindfulness. It's not just that it's the opposite of multitasking. It's the ardent part. The thing about mindfulness that makes mindfulness kind of the, the hard warrior work of this moving toward happiness is the energy we put into the mindfulness. It's not just the paying attention. It's the paying attention with a lot of energy in that paying attention. And I tried hard to come up with a, an example of, of, of what I mean here. And the only thing I could come up with, and I know it's clumsy, but it, what it kind of feels like, for those of you who are now rolling your eyes back to, into the back of your head saying, what is this woman talking about and why? It's sort of like, you know, if you have a big box in the trunk of your car and 
it looks like it's too big to pick up and you you know you know you try to pick it up out of the trunk and you can almost get it but you can't quite you kind of step back and then you just like get energy going in your body you just can feel yourself get this energy or and then you go and you just pick up the bloody box and pull it out of the trunk of your car. You know, people who study martial arts under, understand this really well. And the reason you're able to do it, you just pick this thing up and get it out of your trunk, where six minutes ago you were thinking, oh, I don't know if I can do it, is because you've put energy behind your intention of picking it up. And that's the kind of energy that really makes mindfulness shine and work for us when we're dealing with the world as it is and helps us to be available to everybody else. How can we tell when it started to kick in? And you know, and I don't want to help um, all of you to be, you know, kind of watching your own behavior too much, but there are some clues, if you will, that this is really working for you. And one of them is when, when the I drops away and the only thing that's happening is what's happening. And so what I mean by that is in, in a situation, instead of there being a subject and an object, there's just the verb that's happening. So it's not me picking up the box. The box is, it's, it's that there's a picking upness of this box. And in that place, all things are possible. It's just amazing what can happen when we put energy behind this paying attention. I promise you that it's worth the effort of doing this, that you'll start to discover that even if things in your life don't shift, even if there are still the losses, because that's part of what being a human is all about, you know, even as we all share our, our sicknesses and as we all face our own dyings, we start to get a taste of what Bo tasted with the ladybug and what we both really got to taste when we watched that leaf, this kind of taste that all things are possible and that there is great beauty available to each of us moment to moment. And we don't need to run away from what is to experience that. So I wish all of you ladybugs and leaves and uh, just go for it. Okay, thank you.